Get off my back, you silly monkey, was the first thing I heard as I approached the elaborate red and gold gates of the Buddhist monastery, Maitri Vihar, for the first time. I ran in to help, knowing that the local macaques could be aggressive, especially if there was food. Instead, I saw a young Buddhist monk who had climbed onto another volunteer's back, with the rest of the younger monks cheering him on. After celebrating his victory, he hopped back down off of her and hugged her with a silly smile. Buddhist monks goofing off and being called monkeys? I definitely wasn't expecting that. Is that kind of behavior even allowed at a monastery? Monks aren't supposed to goof off. Are they? These tiny monks really are monkeys. Amelie, a fellow volunteer from Germany, had told me that they got the nickname from being super hyper. I didn't realize exactly how much energy these boys had until the first day of English class. We decided to play hangman with the young monks to help them practice their English letters and spelling. At first, they seemed somewhat disinterested, but by about halfway through class, a group of boys had huddled around the board and were all screaming random letters. A few young stragglers were even running around the classroom, not paying any attention to the game. In order to try and restore order to the classroom, we stopped playing hangman and asked them to each tell us something about themselves. But by that point, it was hopeless. Their attention span had evaporated, and they were all goofing off, talking amongst themselves in brisk Nepali or Tibetan. As soon as we released them from class, the impish group sprinted out of the room, dragging us with them in order to show us how well they could climb a pole. After their lively play session and they left for afternoon prayers called puja, I began to wonder exactly how different the next two weeks would be from what I was expecting. On my second day of work in the monastery, I decided to attend puja. The prayers were almost exactly what I had imagined about Buddhist worship. All the monks from the monastery sat in long lines chanting prayers that they knew by heart. I had to chuckle to myself at how dedicated one of the younger monks was. He was shouting his lines as loud as he could, and his single high-pitched voice stood out from the low hum of the collective voices. And then I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. As I looked at the row of younger monks sitting in front of me, I realized that they were whacking each other whenever they thought it wouldn't be noticed and passing gum back and forth amongst themselves. My jaw dropped a little bit. Aren't monks supposed to be pious, or at least behave during puja? I tapped Amelie and whispered, Are the little ones supposed to be doing that? She laughed quietly at me. No, but kids will be kids. I mulled over that statement for the rest of the day. Namaste. Do you play Candy Crush? Tenor, one of the monks my age, asked as he approached Amelie and I one day after class. What? I was completely baffled. Were the older monks here allowed to have cell phones? I didn't think that modern technology of any sort would be permitted in a Buddhist monastery, much less cell phones. Not only that, but they played Candy Crush on their phones for fun? Yeah, but I left my phone back home in America, so I can't play here, I responded. Looking somewhat disappointed, Tenor explained to me that all of the monks in their monastery had been competing for the title of Candy Crush King, which was held by whoever had been the most levels. Whenever volunteers came to the monastery with a smartphone, the monks liked to include them in the competition as well. Tenor laughed. You'll have to come play soccer with us sometime then. Wait, what? Soccer? I am the king of soccer and I have a thousand girlfriends, Dawa, one of the older monks, proclaimed to me as he scored the last goal of the match. I rolled my eyes at him and flipped another flap on the scoreboard. The last thing I had expected when I decided to teach English at the monastery was to meet an arrogant Buddhist monk. But lo and behold, there was Dawa. He pretended to break the rules in an attempt to make himself seem cool, and he loved to brag about his athletic abilities and imagined romantic conquests. Oi, Ashley! Amelie, check out my abs of steel, he said as he walked by us after the match. I never thought that tiny Buddhist monks would help me break into a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Miss, miss, follow us, my young students cried as they dragged me out of the monastery. I had decided to visit my students at the monastery on our day off, and the little monks really wanted me to play with them at Soyambu, otherwise known as Monkey Temple. However, to get into the temple, I would have to pay a big entrance fee unless they could somehow get me in. Sure enough, the little monks knew just how to sneak me in. Bypassing the main entrance, they pulled me up the few remaining stairs from their monastery to the top of the hill, and just like that, I was in the marketplace of Monkey Temple. I was so worried the whole time that someone was going to catch me, and my little monks were going to get in trouble for sneaking me into Soyambu, 
but I mostly just got a lot of weird glances for being a white female surrounded by a mass of tiny Buddhist monks. We went to their favorite spot and played for a while before chilling out with some ice cream that a local vendor had been selling. We all gazed over the valley below us to the expansive vista of the buildings in Kathmandu that stretched into the distance. It was a beautiful day, and I felt happy to be there with my students, even if they had possibly gone against the rules of their monastery in order to sneak me into Monkey Temple. Germany sucks, called Dawa. We're going to beat you tonight. The World Cup semifinals were happening tonight, and Amelie and I were supporting Germany, while the whole monastery was rooting for France. In honor of the rivalry, Amelie wore a Germany jersey to the monastery that day and created a fun-spirited uproar. Every time we saw the older monks, they would shout derogatory comments about Germany's soccer team at us. Who knew that the monks would be so passionate about France winning the World Cup? Later that night, Amelie and I huddled around the TV to watch the match. Each time that France screwed up a shot or Germany scored a goal, Amelie would send a text to Tenor, who would promptly respond the next time that Germany made an error. The next day, when we walked into the monastery, the monks could barely look at us. Victory had never felt sweeter. After my next to last day of teaching, I decided to relax in the cafe neighboring the monastery for a little while, when one of the elderly monks came to sit by me. I was incredibly excited to get to talk to him. I hadn't had the opportunity to talk to any of the oldest, most knowledgeable monks yet. Do Buddhist monks meditate? was the first question I blurted out after greeting him and introducing myself. He laughed as he pointed at his cell phone. We are modern monks. This is our meditation. I was incredibly confused. All the photographs and media images of monks that I had seen back home in America suggested to me that meditation was a central part of a monk's life. The monks here, however, just surfed the internet and played Candy Crush on their phones. Even the older monks had become accustomed to these new technologies. After that, we talked for an hour or two about Buddhism and Nepal and America, but my mind kept wandering back to the first question I asked that day. After hugging all of my little monkeys and waving goodbye to Tenor, Dawa, and the rest of my older monk friends, I walked out of the front gate for the last time. I looked back at the red and gold gate, and I felt happy about all that the monastery had done for me while I volunteered there. When I first walked through that gate, I had numerous expectations for and stereotypes of Buddhist monks that had been drilled into my head by Hollywood and popular culture in America. My experiences with the monks showed me that I am vulnerable to preconceptions and must recognize that I have thoughts that I might not even realize are stereotypes. I learned that I can defeat these assumptions by seeking out new cultural experiences, spending time with diverse people, and being open to expecting the unexpected.